Hello and welcome to Byju's IS. Let's get started. I look into our daily quiz. Let's look into the first question. Which of the following statements about pardoning powers of the governor is or correct? The governor can pardon, reprieve, respite, remit, suspend or commute a death sentence. Governor does not have the power to pardon the sentence inflicted by a court martial on the convict. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is two only. Why? When you look into the first statement, it is not the governor but it is the president who can pardon the death sentence. So the governor does not have the power to pardon but he has all other powers. So the governor can reprieve, he can respite, he can remit, he can suspend or commute a death sentence but when it comes to the pardoning, he does not have that power. Which is why the first option is wrong and the answer would be two only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because of the reference given in this article. So what are the difference between the pardoning power of the president and the pardoning power of the government? When it comes to the president, he can pardon a sentence of the convict given by the court martial, but that cannot be done by the governor. The president can pardon the death sentence through commutation or its entirety, but that cannot be done by the governor. And when it comes to the president, the president has the pardoning powers. When it comes to offenses committed in the union law, or it can be the concurrent list as well. Similarly, when it comes to the governor, he would be able to have all the pardoning powers in case an offence is committed to the ones which are in the state list as well as in the concurrent list. So these are the differences between the pardoning power of the president and the pardoning power of the governor. Now you might ask me a question. While the Supreme Court of India or the judiciary in India might have gone through evidences, might have fact-checked about all the cases and would have implemented death penalty on a respective person. But why do we have the provision of pardoning power where pardon can be given to a person who is convicted to a death penalty. The answer lies in the Supreme Court judgment and also because of the constitutional paradigm of law versus compassion. What is this law versus compassion? When you look into the Supreme Court of India, what does it do? It interprets the laws. What does the judiciary do? It understands whether that particular convict has committed a crime. If he has committed a crime, according to law, whatever is the suitable punishment, the same will be enforced by the Supreme Supreme Court of India or the respective judiciary. So if he has committed a heinous crime and if that is supposed to be provided with capital punishment, the same is imposed by the Supreme Court of India. But what is the concept of compassion? When you look into the punishment and its protocols, we have what is called as the reformative theory of punishment. What is this reformative theory? Let's say there is one of the person who might have committed an act. This person might be placed in the prisons as well. In the prisons, this person might have reformed himself. He would have changed as well. Which is why the Supreme Court of India in Mohinder Singh versus the state of Punjab has clearly said that when it comes to law, it is the judiciary which will look at evidences and facts. But when it comes to compassion, it is the executive who has to look at the compassion perspective. In case that person has changed, in case the person has evolved, he has brought about a metamorphosis in his life and the conduct of his life, the executive has the prerogative to initiate on the basis of compassionate grounds what is called as the pardoning power, says the Supreme Court. Which is why this constitutional principle of law versus compassion comes into picture. Now let's look into the next practice question. A76 recently seen in news is a team of research scholars visiting Antarctica in an attempt to measure pollution and climate change, a project funded by the European Space Agency to understand the pole's gravity field, a large iceberg that has broken off from the Rone ice shelf in Antarctica, an experiment being conducted in Southern Ocean Antarctica aimed at increasing CO sequestration through ocean iron fertilization. Which of the statements is correct in reference to A76? A76 happens to be a large iceberg that has broken off 
from the Rone Ice Shelf in Antarctica. Why have we taken this practice question? Because of the reference given in this article. So what is this A76? A76 happens to be the world's largest floating iceberg. Where was it? It was in the glaciers of Antarctica and now it has been carved. What is this carved? Carved is nothing but a process where a huge chunk of ice breaks away from the glacier. Since it is one of the huge chunks of ice, A76 is an iceberg which has broken away from the Rone ice shelf and is currently floating in the Weddell Sea. So kindly remember this happens to be a largest of the icebergs that is currently floating in the Weddell Sea. From the factual point of view this iceberg is larger than the Spanish island of Mojarka and this iceberg is currently measuring about 170 kilometer long and 25 kilometer wide. So do remember these important facts apart from this when you look into the atmosphere of Antarctica what we are witnessing is drastic changes in Antarctica because of climate change but in the present situation this breakage is not due to climate change but this is because of the periodic carving. As we initially discussed carving is nothing but breaking of a huge chunk of ice from a glacier but in the present situation the breaking of A76 is not linked to climate change but this is what happens periodically over a period of time. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statements. Tropical cyclones have much more intense rainfall than temperate cyclones. Tropical cyclones are surrounded by closed isobars. The isobars of a temperate cyclone are generally elongated. Which of the above statements is or correct? The answer to this is both. Why have we taken this practice question? Because of the reference given in this article. So what are the differences between the tropical cyclone and the temperate cyclone? Tropical cyclones move from east to west and when it comes to the temperate cyclone, they move from west to east. A tropical cyclone has an effect on a comparatively smaller area, temperate cyclone affect a much larger area. The velocity of wind in a tropical cyclone is much higher and is more damaging. The velocity of air is comparatively lower. Tropical cyclones form only on seas with temperature more than 26 to 27 degrees centigrade and dissipate on reaching the land. The temperate cyclones can be formed both on land as well as the sea. A tropical cyclone does not last for more than 7 days. A temperate cyclone can last for a duration of 15 to 20 days. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following is are the advantages of northern sea route? It could potentially cut the travel distance between East Asia and Western Europe, substantial reduction in transportation time, increased insurance cost and safety considerations. The answer to this is 1 and 2 only. Before we understand the explanation to the question, let's understand what is this northern sea route. When you look into this particular image, this is the northern sea route in the Arctic region. So what exactly happens? This is along the Siberian coast of Russia. When you look into the traditional setup. What is the traditional setup? This is how the shipment is moved from western part of Europe to the eastern part of Asia. So how does it travel? It travels from the western coast of Europe. It goes along the Swiss Canal or along the Cape of Good Hope and ultimately travels through the state of Malacca and ultimately reaches the eastern part. But now what is happening? There are changes that we see in the Arctic Ocean. Why? Because of climate change. Because of climate change, the extent of sea ice that is covering the Arctic Ocean is declining over a period of time. So during the summer season, what we have is the ice-free region in the northern part where you would be able to move the shipments in the northern part from the western Europe to the eastern part of Asia, which is what is called as the northern sea route. So what is this northern sea route? This is a route or a shipping lane which is present along the coast of the Siberian coast in Russia so that one would be able to connect the western part of Europe to the eastern part of Asia. This will help in reduction of the transportation cost. Why? Because they had to go through a long way but now what they travel through is a shorter way. So the transportation cost is reduced and at the same time the delay is also reduced. This will be much shorter as well. They will also reduce the fuel consumption as well. They will also reduce the environmental emission as well and this 
to a limited extent also eliminates the piracy in that region so these are some of the advantages when one takes what is called as the northern sea route but when you look into the third option it says increased insurance cost and safety considerations this is not an advantage but instead it is a disadvantage how is it a disadvantage for all the shipments that needs to be carried across in the northern sea route now all the shipments and the shipping companies will have to spend more on the insurance cost apart from this they also will have to increase the safety considerations as well that is because this particular region is generally open for a period of about three months or it is even less than that as well why because it is only during the summer season this region will be ice free but for the rest of the times it is completely occupied with ice so what we require is more insurance cover what we require is more safety measures which means it is more disadvantageous for the company which is operating it which is why it is not an advantage but instead it is a disadvantage why have we taken this practice question because of the reference given in this article now let's look into the next practice question recombinant dna technology also called as genetic engineering allows genes to be transferred across different species of plants from animals to plants from microorganisms to higher organisms select the correct answer using the code given below the answer to this is 1 2 and 3 when it comes to recombinant dna technology yes it can be performed across different species of plants from animals to plants and from microorganisms to higher organisms as well this happens to be a previous year question from the year 2013 now let's look into the fact of the day. The fact of the day for today's discussion is National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. This particular body happens to be a statutory body. This usually has multiple functions when it comes to safeguarding the rights of the child. So what are the functions of this particular body? There are n number of laws and constitutional provisions that are present to protect the rights of this child. So what will this body do? So this National Commission for the protection of child rights will ensure that all these laws are implemented and in case there is any violation of these laws then the same is reported to the government so that action can be initiated by the government so this will strive to ensure all laws and policies in the country are in consonance with the rights of children as emphasized in the Indian Constitution as well as UN Convention on the Rights of the Child who is a child any individual who is between the age group of 0 to 18 years will be called as a child and this authority will have special focus with respect to the vulnerable sections of the society what is the composition of this particular group as we discussed this happens to be a statutory organization it will have a chairperson who is a person of eminence and has exemplary record of work when it comes to child welfare and it has six members where in the six members two will have to be women members and they should have experience in the field of education child care welfare and child development child psychology and sociology juvenile justice elimination of child labor and loss relating to children if they have the experience in working in such sectors they would be part of this ncpcr what are the functions of this particular authority they will review the safeguards that are provided to the child rights protection india we did discuss about it present reports on the workings of the law we did discuss about it inquire cases of child right violations and initiate proceedings they will study the factors that prevent the enjoyment of rights who are impacted by terrorism maltreatment so on and so forth and suggest remedial measures to the government they'll inquire into the needs of the children requiring special care and protection such as the disadvantaged and the marginalized children they will review the current policies with respect to the child rights and suggest changes conduct research in the field of child rights they advocate child rights promote disseminate the idea through mass campaigns and seminars undertake investigation into specific complaints received from children encourage the incorporation of child rights in school curriculums this commission is also mandated to inquire into two major laws in India one happens to be the POCSO Act the other is the right to education act so it has to look at all the rights that are guaranteed to the children 
if it is violated how is that we have to safeguard what remedial measures have to be taken is what is this national commission for the protection of child rights it is this that we have to understand in reference to this article this is it for today thank you for watching all the best